Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to Sea Alaska Heritage Institute's YouTube channel today for our culturally responsive education lecture series. My name is Christy Dillingham. I'm the education director here at SHI. The goal to, is to unveil the goal of our lecture series is to unveil the educational inequities and social injustices that have long been part of the educational system and history here in Alaska. This series will feature presenters that will speak on topics to help community members expand their understanding of the legacy of colonization and the impacts on education as it relates to Tlingit culture and history. This series is part of SHI's goal to promote cross-cultural understandings. For today, our first lecturer is Shken George. Shken is Dak Klanwedi from Angoon. She grew up in her clan house, Kit Uhu Hit, the killer whale tooth house, with her mother and Deshitan father from Deshuhit, um, end of the trail house. She attended and graduated from Angoon schools. After college, she returned as a teacher to begin her 22 year long career uh, that pri prioritized culture, arts, and Klingit language in the classrooms for all of her students throughout Southeast Alaska. So without further ado, I'd like to bring Shken George up here at this time. Gunish Chish. Thank you, Christy. And thank you, um, everybody who's here today and who will watch in the future. Um, I want to start off by apologizing if I don't make great eye contact today. Um, I'm going to be reading. I'm not um, practiced at public speaking, and I'm pretty nervous today to, to be doing this, but I'll give it my best shot. Um, like Chrissy already introduced um, me, my name is Shkendutun Robin K. George. My grandfather gave me that name, Shkendutun, when I was born. Um, he named me after his um, grandmother who raised him. I am Dakhlawedi from Angoon, and I did grow up in my clan house, the Kilowell Tooth House. It is the same house that my father was born in. My dad, Dakh Dina, is Deshitan from Deshuhit, the end of the trail house. He was born to Jimmy, jo Li Jimmy and Lydia George, Wichkadaha and Kudeshke in 1945. He often says that he was born in the jaws of the killer whale because of our house name. My dad married my mom in 1969. Her name is Joanne George, um, the same Joanne George that's famous for her amazing artwork. Um, she's from New Hampshire. Her parents were Olive and Kelly Callahan, and she moved to Alaska in 1967, right after college, to be a teacher. Um, I never thought that I would, but I followed right in her footsteps, teaching and doing art. I have two amazing daughters with Jason Frank. He is on Khakitan, dog salmon, from the Central House in Angoon. Our daughter, Gabrielle, carries the name of Shkendutun's daughter, Shawat Guch. Shawat Guch was my grandfather's mother, but like I had said, he was raised by Shkendutun. We also have a five-year-old daughter. Her name is Elizabeth K. She is named after Jason's grandmother, Elizabeth Frank. Elizabeth was married to Wally Frank, who is Kaguantan. Lizzie is called Awaste. There were two Awastes in my family, one on my grandfather's side and also one on my grandmother's side. Um, she carries that name today. I open with these comments because in our culture, knowing who you are is the thing 
that every elder that I have ever listened to has said is the most important thing that you need to learn. That knowing your lineage, knowing who you come from, knowing where you come from, and how you are intertwined is the most important part of our life as Lingit people. Not just knowing this, but acknowledging your connections, affirming and establishing relationships are a key part of our social structure. It determines everything from who you marry to who takes care of you when you pass on. It's often joked about how long-winded Tlingit people are and how not to give us a mic or we'll be talking all night. But this is our culture. This is how we survive. This is how we thrive. Talking about and acknowledging these connections is deeply rooted in who we are and how we interact. And yet, it is something that is often cut short as soon as we try and bring culture into the modern school system. I've been on many curriculum review committees and many meetings where we talk about bringing culture into the classroom. And every document that I have looked at has said, one way to do this is to invite an elder into the classroom, invite a culture bearer into the classroom. But when we do that, we often will give them time limits and ask them to be specific about what they talk about and to only talk about the topic that they are being asked to present. But we are not like that. We are a holistic people. We don't work in isolation. We don't learn in isolation but we are asked to teach isolated subjects and to compartmentalize ourselves. Today I'm here to kick off a series of lectures by amazing people, much more worthy of being listened to for an hour than me. But it's a series on culturally responsive education. You're gonna hear from Dan Monteith, Misha Jackson, Peggy Cowan, and the amazing Ernestine Hayes. But today I'm here to share because my life is dotted with several pivotal moments that have kept me steady on my course in education. I'm going to share some of these experiences from the time I was a little girl to things that I experienced just this past summer. Like I mentioned before, I've spoken to teachers in the past. I've been on panels, I've done workshops, I've written lessons and units about including culture in schools but today, I'm not talking to educators. Today, I'm hoping to make a case to the parents, the aunties, the uncles, the grandmas, the grandpas, and all the supporters of our children to believe in, to push for, and to demand culturally responsive education for all students. I'm missing a slide. <laughs> um, so I wanted to start with an image of myself in kindergarten. Um, my dad was attending Humboldt University in Northern California at the time. It was Thanksgiving and we were asked if we wanted to be a pilgrim or an Indian to celebrate the coming of the Mayflower. I don't have a lot to say about this image. I wanted it to speak for itself, but I actually, oh, there it is. <laughs> um, okay, so we were asked, you know, if we wanted to be a pilgrim or an Indian. Um, I was, I don't really remember this moment, um, but I do remember afterwards taking off my headband and my feathers and helping to clean up. It just seemed like an interesting way to show how my Western education began. Soon after that experience in kindergarten, we moved home to Angoon. My grandpa was in his 80s, and my dad thought it was time to come home and spend time with him in his last years. So we moved home, and I started school at Angoon Elementary. And that was when I was in kindergarten. My grandpa lived and passed away 
right before my senior year in high school. <laughs> but it's second grade that I want to talk about today. Second grade was a powerful year for me. Second grade was the first time that I got angry. It was the first time that I realized things weren't right, things weren't fair, and it was the first time that I decided to do something about it. Up until this point, people called me Robin. My mom named me Robin K when I was born, and that was what was on my birth certificate. But my family, my grandparents, they all called me Shkendutan. My aunties and my uncles, they called me grandma because Shkendutan was their grandma. One night as my mom was putting me to bed, I asked her, why do all the families in Angoon have first names for last names? James, Jack, John, Jim, George, Frank. <laughs> She proceeded to tell me about the giving of name, surnames out to Klingit families and how some families didn't even get the same last names, like in my family. My grandpa got the last name of George, but one of his siblings got the last name of Albert. She also told me about how a few families had their Klingit names modified and those became their last names. Like there was a man named Kukash, his name got modified to an English version of Kukash, and now that's their last name. <laughs> All of this just enraged me. This little second grade girl was so mad that night, so mad that I decided from then on, everybody was going to call me by my Klingit name. I wanted everyone to call me Shkendutan. The next day, I told my best friend, JJ Kukash, Jaylene, that I was changing my name. Now she went to school the next day and she told our teacher. Our teacher was my call. I remember him looking at me and asking me, is this true? Do you want us to call you Shkendutan? I think I said yes. I probably just nodded. <laughs> and he did, and it was amazing. And JJ, she kept people in line and reminded them over and over again that my name wasn't Robin anymore. Now, imagine what would have happened if he had dismissed me and didn't honor my request. I was mad, but probably not mad enough to stand up to my teacher. Mr. Hall respected me and my classmates in other ways as well. I was always making things at home, like always. Um, and somehow in second grade, I decided to make dioramas. It's kind of funny now because I really can't stand it when the Native American unit is to have students make a historically inaccurate Indian scene. <laughs> but at the time, I thought it was really cool. So I took it to school and I showed my teacher, Mr. Hull. He not only gave me positive comments about being creative and thoughtful, he let me build it on a bigger scale. JJ and I worked together to turn a corner of our classroom into an entire village with longhouses, totems, and a backdrop with trees and animals. That was about the same time that Wayne Price, who did the amazing ads work and work in this building that I'm standing in, was um, teaching us how to carve ivory soap. <laughs> All of us got to carve with real knives, real butter knives, <laughs> on ivory soap. And I made a killer whale, of course. Mr. Hall honored our knowledge and interests. He let us take the lead on what we wanted to learn about. He showed me what it meant to be a culturally responsive teacher and really opened the path that led me down this road to becoming the teacher with the name that I still use today. He could have shut me down. He could have squashed my ideas and passion, but instead he supported and encouraged. Gunachtish, Mr. Hall. High school brings me to the next time 
that I had those strong inner stirrings about culture and what was taken from us. I was at AFN, Elders and Youth Conference in Anchorage, when I heard other students from around the state speaking their native languages. I remember how much it surprised me, like truly surprised me. I remember feeling bad that I wasn't able to speak Clinket. I remember hoping to avoid situations where I would have to admit in front of people that I couldn't speak our language. I can't say that anything really came of that moment, but the feeling stuck with me. It was a feeling of shame and embarrassment and regret for not knowing. And I still carry that feeling with me today. My education in Angoon, it, it wasn't bad. <laughs> it wasn't like hurtful in a direct kind of way. I don't feel like anyone intentionally said, let's not teach kids their culture, and yet they didn't. I mentioned that Wayne Price came, and sometimes we had guests that did things with us, but culture wasn't a purposeful part of our school. At one point while I was in college, my grandma was teaching culture and dance at the elementary school, and we also had a dance group when I was um, in elementary school through JOM. We had beating after school with Bessie and Martha. But we didn't read native authors. We didn't learn about the bombardment of Angoon in school. We weren't taught about land claims or the marine life that surrounded our entire village. <laughs> Information that I had to learn about later on my own wasn't taught in our school. We didn't see ourselves in their, our school. There were some carvings on the walls, but there wasn't culture in the curriculum. We left our culture at home. We learned early on to compartmentalize. After high school, I left our little village of 500 people and my big class of 10 students and went to the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. Here is where I found out all the things I didn't know. College is where I realized I was different. I was so different. Growing up in the village, you aren't confronted with the fact that Native Americans are rare because we're all Native. But when, you, when I was in Washington, I got so at asked so often, what are you? By complete strangers who thought it was okay to just come up to me at the mall or at the park and ask me what I was. <laughs> I dealt with going to school pretty okay. I mean, I missed home, but I wouldn't say I was extremely homesick. But being asked these kinds of things really made me feel alone. I sought the comfort of the only other minorities at my school. It was the students that were from Hawaii. And they weren't all Native Hawaiians. In fact, few of them were. But they gathered together like I was used to, and they ate a lot of rice. <laughs> I was envious of their tie to each other and that they had each other. My school didn't have a Native population. It wasn't until my second year at Puget Sound that I finally ran into the other native girl at the school. This is a really bad picture, a picture of a picture. <laughs> but she saw me at the art studio. I was changing out of my clay covered overalls and just a shout out to Misha, I was rocking the TLC style. <laughs> when I heard a girl say, Hey, you Indian? With a real native accent. I turned around at the same time while I said yes, and I knew that I recognized her, even though I had never met her. Her name is Danielle. She is Crow from Montana. We stuck together for the rest of my time there, and she introduced me to the powwow. 
She hooked me up with some other clinkets in the Tacoma area. I even found a dance group led by Tiny Burrell and danced with them that year at Celebration. I also started reading. When I say college is where I learned all the things I didn't know, I didn't learn it in my classes. I kind of learned it on my own. I started making trips to Seattle and going to the UW bookstore, and I bought whatever I could afford in Indian reading. The first book I bought was Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, and my mind was blown, and my heart was broken. <laughs> I remember reading it in the back of the car. I don't remember who was driving, like if it was my parents or if one of my friends was driving, but I was reading, I couldn't put it down. I was in the back of my car reading out loud passage after passage of the horrifying history of Native people that I had never heard before. How could I have never heard these things? This was my awakening, my realization that the system was oppressive only remembering their history, only telling their story. And this is where I ask you, I wonder when did you realize that the system was oppressive, restrictive, omitting, that you or others were erased from the history books, that your story isn't being told, that you aren't included in the narrative, that your history is not valued or worth remembering that your experience is not as important as others. This was the time that all I had learned outside of school became more important to my survival at school than what, was, than what school had taught me up to this point. Knowing who I was knowing my history, being able to share my story and not being crushed by others was key to me making it through college. I wasn't good at writing, but I could get help with that. I was struggling in biology, but I could get help with that. <laughs> being asked, what are you, repeatedly and not being around anyone who understood what being Dachlawedi meant to me, feeling alone, not having someone to connect with. That's what almost broke me, but it didn't <laughs> because I knew my culture that my grandpa had taught me. I know who I am. School didn't teach me that, my family did. College really gave me a chance to grow and open my eyes that native issues to native issues, but I had always known that I wanted to go home, and I did. After I graduated with a BA in Fine Arts, I attended the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico, just for a semester, just to go see what it was like. And then in the summer of 1996, I went home. I think at this point, a switch happened. Um, my experiences shifted from me realizing the things that have happened in the past to things were really happening to me, the more blatant anti-culture acts. <laughs> Um, were happening to me. Because as a young person from the village, in your late teens and early 20s, you hear this a lot. Go get your education and come back and give back to your community. But when I did this, I received many negative comments, <laughs> but none quite so shocking to me was when I was invited 
to visit the then superintendent. I was point blank asked if I was too scared to leave Angoon. I had been gone at college for five years and graduated and traveled. I took summer classes at various schools from UH in Hawaii to Tacoma Community College just to be around other things and meet other people. I had been home for one year and I was starting to work on my teaching certification. But this wasn't looked at as a success for myself. I was seen as giving up and not having what it takes to make it somewhere else, somewhere bigger. Yet I felt like I had, I had made it. My choice was to be home and my choice was seen as a failure. It made me wonder why they were there. If coming home was a failure, what did she think of the people of Angoon? If coming home was the wrong choice, what was her end goal for our current students? To make everyone leave Angoon? What did she see as a successful person? And what messages was the school giving our kids? I not only heard this from the superintendent, but also from community members. Why did you come back? It enraged me anymore, and I felt I had something to prove. I needed to show that I was worthy, and that coming home was a choice, and not something I was stuck with. Being by family and being in our culture has always been priority number one for me. I have other cultural responsibilities that I take seriously, and I needed to be home to fulfill them. Again, I always knew this. It got me thinking again, what does success mean? What does it look like? Our grandparents always said, the most important thing is to know who you are. I spent the upcoming year with Mary Jean Duncan in her second and third grade class, and she was my mentor teacher. Mary Jean was one of a handful of native teachers in the state, and I was lucky enough to get her as my mentor. It was the year that I learned the Pledge of Allegiance in Clinkett. We said it every morning and at basketball games. Pauline Duncan had developed a set of materials with her husband, Paul Duncan, in Sitka. As far as I know, it's one of the few published materials in Clinkett at that time. These groundbreaking women had it right from the start 30 years ago. They were setting the standard for bringing Clinkett language into the regular ed classroom, and this was just the beginning. The following year, I lucked out again. The first grade teacher moved to a different position in our school, and there was an opening. An opening in a three-teacher school was rare. I, I was hired, and Jackie Kukash was the new principal. Amazing. A native woman principal at my first job. But this year was still a struggle. I wanted so much more. I didn't see the relevance of the math subject matter. Why were we counting monkeys and bananas? I spent hours changing it all to bears and blueberries. When kids came into my room and saw the blueberry bushes on the walls, they immediately began sharing stories about picking berries with their families. They had ideas for writing, and one little girl named Cheyenne Braley had all kinds of questions about what else bears eat. That one bulletin board changed the whole attitude of my class about journal time. Would this have happened with monkeys and bananas? I doubt it. There's no connection to that. There's no relevance. There's no relationship. The same thing happened with my calendar. 
I just couldn't get myself to put up the little decorations of yellow school buses and red school houses with bells on top. So I asked my mom, remember she's an artist, <laughs> can you make me some calendar stuff? She made 12 salmon for the months of the year. She made an octopus for the days of the week. And then on that one extra leg, we wrote days of the week. <laughs> We had so many rich discussions around the art that my mom created. We talked about octopus, salmon, fishing, food, gathering with our families. The kids even wanted to make their own salmon and learn how to paint just by having those things up on the wall. At that time, I didn't know what culturally responsive education was. I just knew that what I was given to present to kids didn't make sense in Angoon, Alaska. That same year, we showed the video of the bombardment to our kids 100 years later. And one little boy at the end said, man, I wish Indian people were still around. Even in that video that had his grandparents and parents in it, he didn't see himself and his culture as still being alive. So much of what we do have that represents us is in a past tense manner. That it seems like we might still be here physically, but culturally we are gone. And that is not true. That year was only the beginning of years of making my own materials, spending hours cutting and gluing before copy and paste on the laptop was a thing. For the past 23 years, I've spent a majority of my prep time for class making my own materials, something Native teachers are still spending their weekends doing. There's the materials issue, and then there's the ignorance issue. Several times in my career, I have had to defend myself and what I was teaching to administrators who just didn't get it. There were many, but I'm gonna share two. The two I chose to tell you about today happened about 10 years apart. Both of them around the Elizabeth Pradovich lessons that we do in February. Remember, these happen in February. Six months of school have passed. Granted, both of these principals were new principals, but they had been living and working in Angoon for six months. Both had spent previous years in places in Southeast Alaska, and they should have known. The first was in about 2008 or so, and we were sitting in a planning meeting with the teachers talking about activities to do around the A and B and A and S and Elizabeth Pradovich. When the principal asks, who is this person you are talking about and why are we having a celebration around them? We start to tell him about her and how she was a member of the A and S, and he asks, what is the ANS? And when we said, it's the Alaska Native Sisterhood, his first thought to comment was, sounds like a sexist organization to, organization to me. What, don't they like men? Granted, he may have been joking and whatnot, but seriously, this was his first thought. <laughs> then after we moved on, we said, well, there was also the A and B. And our high school, where you work and lead our students, is named after Eli Katnuk, who was one of the founding members of the A and B. He didn't get it. We were then looking at the Elizabeth Pradovich unit that, from SHI, and he asked his questions again. What is SHI? We talk about it and he keeps looking confused. He doesn't understand why an airline is producing curriculum materials 
Oh, I'm sorry. I'm all messed up. He, he doesn't understand why an airline is producing curriculum materials. Because when we were talking about Sea Alaska, he thought we were talking about Alaska seaplanes. <laughs> I've often felt like that gut disgust reaction that I had with a principal who would come to Angoon and not have any basic knowledge of our community and the organizations who support our schools and students that I had an overreaction. But why should I have to pull back on my feelings when he hasn't put any thought or time into ours? Then again, 10 years later, I'm back in Angoon, and it's February again. And my class is singing the Elizabeth Paradovich rap created by Duck Ginny. The new principal stops by my classroom and listens. The kids leave for lunch, and he comes over to say, the kids sounds, sound great. Seems like they really like singing. But aren't you worried you're teaching them to hate white people? All I heard in my mind was, aren't you worried you're teaching them to hate me? It was all about him. It's funny how when we bring up, bring up the past, we get told to get over it, it didn't happen to you personally, and you shouldn't feel hurt by it. I, again, don't even remember what I said to him. I was stunned. But if I could go back, I would have said something about how it isn't about you. We are still dealing with the effects of what happened to our parents and grandparents. The textbooks that you bought for us to read from McGraw-Hill that supposedly include social studies topics don't talk about Clinkett leaders. We are not in those books. This isn't about you. It's about us. Speaking of those books, I was just telling you about all the time that it takes to create materials that are inclusive of our Clinket people. I have mentioned the big company name that makes reading materials. You might know about the ordeal that we went through in 2004 here in Juneau, when I opened a box of brand new books only to find another attempt to sugarcoat our history. This experience I'm gonna tell you about far outweighed all of my other strong emotional moments from learning about our names to reading Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. The district had just purchased a new reading curriculum program. Every elementary classroom in Juneau was getting boxes and boxes full of books for their classrooms. I love books. I love them, and I couldn't wait. I was in my room a week or so before we were even on contract, setting up my room and unpacking, when I opened a box and pulled out this book. First thought, wow, books about natives, cool. And I opened the book, read a passage. Second thought, oh no, is this as bad as it feels? My hands are shaking, my heart is racing. My third thought, why? <laughs> why does it have to be like this? <laughs> my fourth thought, am I overreacting? My fifth thought, who do I tell? Do I tell? Are people gonna think I'm being ridiculous? I start snapping pictures. <laughs> These are the very pictures that I snapped that day. <laughs> and I start calling, what do you think? Is this bad? This is bad, right? Am I right? <laughs> Why am I doubting myself so much? Who do we tell? Who, what do you think can be done? Do you think anyone else will care? <laughs> These are in every fourth grade classroom in Juneau. What do I do? What can I do? I started calling and emailing anyone who I thought could help me clarify my thinking affirmed to me that I wasn't crazy for being so effective. Everyone 
was shocked to see and read what was going to be presented to fourth graders in Juneau. I got the affirmation that I needed. Soon, Sea Alaska Heritage was involved, Gold Belt Heritage was involved, emails and phone calls were going around, and next it was being shared to the school board. Committees were formed, the Juno Empire wrote articles, UAS professors were talking about the tone of the books and how they were diminishing the experiences of Native people. Elders were crying at the memories of having their mouths washed out with soap when they spoke. It wasn't just me. <laughs> the, most the most common comment that was brought up about the books was, is the truth too much for kids? Should we even be talking about this with them? Comparisons with the Holocaust were brought up, and the fact that teaching about World War II is pretty commonplace in elementary schools. If they can learn about that, they can certainly learn about boarding schools. But the fact that I second-guessed myself, third-guessed myself, felt hesitant to speak up because I might be told I'm overreacting again, that insecure part of me that makes me scared to defend myself and our culture, that is ingrained in me from years of schooling to be passive in our recollection of our history. But overcoming that fear is also ingrained in me by centuries of strong, flingant women ancestors. I continue to have to overcome obstacles in bringing culture into the classroom. Moving to Juneau and joining the TCLL team in 2002 with Kitty Eddy and Nancy Douglas, where I was in a program whose whole intent is to teach students in a culturally relevant way, and yet we still face questions about our teaching practices. Are we making sure to do the real academics first? Are we teaching kids to read, write, and do math? Or are they just singing and dancing and beating? As if that's all our culture is. So many times over the years I have had to say, yes, I am teaching to the standards. While metaphorically and physically, I closed my door and presented materials to my students that they felt connected to in a sense, bringing the culture of our students in the back door. Even up to this year, in a summer school camp setting, I heard, yes, you can teach culture, but do the other things first. I admit I almost backed out of this opportunity to teach at home in Angoon to my kids, but Instead, I decided to go and bring our culture in the back door again. Because instead of acknowledging that our culture is a vehicle to bring the content to the students, it is still treated as an add-on, something extra to do if there's time. It still isn't understood that our culture is a lens that we access the standards through that presenting this way gives our kids the opportunity to live in both worlds and have those worlds come together so that we don't have to compartmentalize as much, so that our children can have an easier time than we did. And isn't that always the goal? <laughs> to learn the skills needed to succeed in Western education by using culture and place-based knowledge that they already bring to the table to access that learning. Now, working with organizations and schools around Alaska, there are many teachers that are working toward a shift to shape pedagogy to a culturally responsive education system. With an amazing team of teachers at the TCLL program at Harborview, we have been working for years on taking the state standards, local standards, and combining them and looking at them through that cultural knowledge lens. 
For example, the concept of wuqin, working together. Starting off a unit of study with the idea of wuqin, asking students, how do things work together? How do we work together in our families, in our classrooms, in our homes, in our communities, in our clans, and with our opposites? But then taking it beyond those ideas of people literally working together. How do ecosystems work together? How do numbers work together? That isn't an odd concept. Right now in the Juno School District, the adopted math material has years of number bond works. I mean, number bonds are numbers working together. We just call it what we call it, Wu Qin. How do letters work together? What happens if you put two O's together? What sound do they make now? When we read two books about the same topic, how is the knowledge that we gained from each shaping our understanding of the topic? How did these two sources of information work together? Bringing this overarching idea or theme, if you will, grounds students and gives that common thread to the day that makes it less compartmentalized and more in sync with native ways of knowing. Another thing that we are working on at TCLL is taking the science and social studies standards and uniting them. For example, take CEDAR. We use the topic of CEDAR as a vehicle to cover the essential questions in kindergarten of how do families meet their needs for food, clothing, and shelter? And the science standard essential question, why do plants and animals live where they do? And instead of looking at science and social studies as separate subjects, we unite them, we bring them together and teach reading, writing, and math skills with these topics from the science and social studies standards. All of it by thinking about it through a Clinkett worldview and CEDAR. All of this supports students, makes us less compartmentalized. Now, you might wonder, as aunties, uncles, grandmas, grandpas, how can I support culturally responsive education in my community school? This is where we need to be active. We need to make sure that people who are hired to teach our children have a basic understanding of the place that they are teaching at. We need to make sure that our school board members value the important work that needs to be done to ensure this, to elect board members who support equity and support the work of teachers to bring culturally responsive education into the classroom, that our elected representation supports schools that will do teacher trainings as opposed to just buying canned curriculums that are out of touch with our reality. I look back at my educational life and I see things coming full circle. My grandma who taught dance and culture in the school had a little girl drummer in elementary school named Chinera. Chinera now teaches Clinket language in our schools with Marsha Hotch at Eli Katnuk High School. That little girl in first grade who had so many questions about what bears eat, Cheyenne Braley, now Cheyenne Kukash, is in the Clinket language teacher training program offered by SHI not Alaska seaplanes. <laughs> there will no longer be sneaking 
our culture into the classroom by the back door. We were forced into schools, and now we need to force schools to listen to us. We adapted, and now it's the school's turn. I believe we're going to take questions now. I think I finished a little bit early, but... <laughs> I just read? Okay, so <clears throat> first question I have up is um, how do you suggest supporting teachers that don't have experience or knowledge in Alaska Native cultures? I think this is, you know, this is one of the keys that we have to figure out. And there's been so many amazing trainings that Sea Alaska Heritage has done. Um, to, to help bring this knowledge to, to teachers who may not have it. But I think one of the most important things is experiencing the culture yourself. So spending time in the communities that you're at. Um, if schools can provide, I've, I've been a part of and um, heard of many teacher trainings in the summer where you, they went and worked on fish and worked on berries and heard songs and got to experience that feeling of, of the culture. Making trips to Glacier Bay and their clan house has been an amazing experience. But I think, you know, we can't put all of the pressure on teachers finding it themselves. School districts need to provide that training and that's the difference between saying, okay, we're going to spend time and money and invest in people and teachers as opposed to buying those curriculums and just handing them out. Um, yeah. So how do we approach culturally responsive education that supports Native and non-Native students? This question comes up a lot. Um, I have taught in, in, I've taught most of my career in primarily all Native student classrooms, but I did teach for about five years at, at um, Gastineau where I had mixed, um, mixed classes. And culturally responsive education benefits everybody. Knowing about the place that you're at benefits everybody. I've used the example that I did go and teach in, in Japan um, for a year in 2010. And can you, I couldn't imagine going to Japan and not learning about their culture. It's, this is where we're at. This is the place that, that um, should be included in schools. And it also helps when you learn about other people around you, it helps um, with the stereotypes and racism if you have that understanding of each other. So just making it open to everybody. I, there was one um, project that I did at Gassino where we made drums. We got the deer hides. We soaked them, we scraped them, we strung them up, we dried them, we put them on our drum hoops. And it was all around a history lesson about how songs and music record history. Not just in Klingit culture, but in American history. We looked at the Star Spangled Banner and um, Yankee Doodle went to town. We looked at drums and the importance of drums in cultures in Taiwan. And just, you know, it's a universal concept to sing about your experiences and to record history. And we do that here too. And that was our kind of our culminating activity, but it was wonderful for all kids. It wasn't a Klingit unit. It was a unit on songs and we just included ourselves in it. 
So doing things like that, you know, this, the idea of when I mentioned routine, working together isn't a exclusively Clinkit idea. It's a worldwide idea. Um, but when we say it routine, we honor this place that we're in. So. What is the most important thing you take away from your time? away as a teacher that you would like to convey to other Native teachers? Mm. What is the most important thing you take away from your time as a teacher? You know, I was, I, I didn't mention that I retired this past year and um, from teaching, um, not from working, but just from in the classroom. And it's really, it's really hard. <laughs> it's really hard being a native teacher. It's you have to do. Um, you have to do everything every other teacher is doing, and bring in the culture. And so it's just that added layer of pressure. Um, I think we we put that pressure on ourselves. Our families put that pressure on us. Our communities put that pressure on us, and it's a it's a wonderful thing. It is an honor to teach our students um, our native ways. But it's also exhausting. <laughs> and I mentioned in my talk about all the times that I have been angered or mad or hurt by things in native education. And looking back this year, I feel like being in schools, especially the last like five or six years, I felt like I was mad all the time. I was upset about something all the time because you're just constantly in a battle fighting for our culture and our kids and it's exhausting. And making sure that you have a support network, making sure that you don't work in isolation and making sure that you find ways to remember to be happy. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, I wasn't really expecting to share that. Uh, it's just something I've just been realizing this past week or so as everybody else goes back to school, that that weight is kind of lifted. Um, there's a little bit of guilt there too, but that's okay. <laughs> Are we good? Again, for sharing your personal knowledge, your stories, and your experiences. You've set a solid foundation for the remainder of the lecture series. Um, it's been an honor and a pleasure to have you up here to start out our lecture series. As we were designing this series, in my heart, I knew you were the right person to get us started. Gunish So everyone, um, we have several more lectures coming up through the month of September. On September 11th, we have History and Healing, a story of Douglas um, with Dan Monteith. On September 15th, we have History of Alaska Native Education with Misha Plunkett Jackson. September 22nd, we have culturally responsive curriculum from governance to classroom with Peggy Cowan. And closing us out on September 29th, we have crafting change with Ernestine Hayes. All of these lectures will be a live broadcast to our Sea Alaska Heritage Institute's YouTube channel. We encourage you to log in you're welcome to add your comments. You're welcome to add your questions. Um, and we look forward for you to join us for the rest of this lecture series. Gunish Chish. <laughs>